The filmmaker that I am, you know, even that night I was very aware, I was going like, you know, I wanna make a film about this. I remember talking to her about it. She's like, what are you talking about? I said, this, you know, it's just, it's just this feeling, this feeling, this thing about discovering someone else, that infatuation, attraction, what it brings out in you. What are the stakes? You know, everything's about stakes in the screenplay. The stakes are, oh, if he doesn't get that, then he'll not achieve this. And, you know, here come all the plot points. I'm like, what are the stakes? It's like you're alive, you know? <laughs> you're just trying to make it to the world. You don't talk about a character and experience. You show them having the experience. But I never, I never approached cinema like that. It never, I always thought people talking was so evocative and what they're describing, it has a double effect. Because not only does it conjure what they're talking about in the viewer's mind, because you're not showing it, to me it's more interesting. Because you not only do you get the essence of them and what they're saying, but also what they're talking about. This mythical audience we have that we think is, we know it's small, but it's deep. And we have a bond with them that we're not gonna lie to them. We would meet and, you know, I might tell him like, hey, when you at a party this year, or if you meet a girl and find yourself in an intimate conversation, I want you to write down what you say. You know, I would, I want, I want like a real teenage conversation here. I remember moving there and just thinking, oh, this is all I really want. I just want to be here, watch movies, make movies. A lot of people, thought, oh, you'd have to go to New York or LA to do what I do, but I was like, no, I'm just gonna make it work here. I was really looking for those little things. I wanted the film to feel like a memory, really, of like, him maybe looking back over his childhood from the vantage point of the young adult that he is at the end. So I really wanted to avoid, I mean, just, just personally, I remember thinking those big moments that are so, are made, you know, they, they make movies about them, they, it's represented a lot. I was kind of like, those moments aren't what I remember. You know, I approach everything like that. You know, when I make a teenage movie, it's like, well, I was, what do I remember? And here's the essence of what I remember. And I was kind of trying to do that here. It's like, well, why do I remember this little moment that no one else would, you know? It's a collection of kind of lesser moments. So I could talk about the film on a, can say, oh, 12 years, everybody gets old. And people would ask, well, so, so what happens in the movie? And I was like, not much, you know? But it, I was counting on the cumulative effect of you know the way we perceive cinema you really invest in these characters and i felt that it potentially could have the significance that it has in one's own life these little memories if the investment was there in these characters that these little things that have no business being in a narrative they don't advance character they don't advance plot you know what has to be in a movie that you actually could have it, that be the essence of the movie, and it would matter because you are invested in these, in these characters. After doing two sprawling ensembles of Slacker and Dazed and Confused, I remember having this urge inside me to take those methods of how I kind of shape material and work with cast. I remember thinking, it's time to do that intimate story. And I'd been thinking about this since, I remember it was the fall of 89. I was just kind of, Leaving New York, I went through Philly, and I was visiting my sister for one night, and I was leaving the next day. And I just met this young woman at a toy store. My sister and I, we had wandered into a toy store, and she was working there. She was kind of flirting with me. And we just had this kind of connection. And I did something I would never do. I'm kind of shy. I wrote her a little note and slipped it to her and said, hey, I'm in town for one night. You know, do you, do you want to? go get a drink, you know, do something after. And she went back, yeah, sure. I'm like, wow, okay. And so we really spent that whole night just walking around Philly. It was just kind of that, that magical thing that happens between people. The filmmaker that I am, you know, even that night I was very aware, I was going like, you know, I wanna make a film about this. I remember talking to her about it. She's like, what are you talking about? I said, this, you know, it's just, just this feeling, this feeling, this thing about discovering someone else, that infatuation, attraction, what it brings out in you. All that. While making Slacker, I determined that, oh, my next film, I wanna make, I have this teenage movie I wanna make. It's just kids riding around looking for something to do. That was my central metaphor for that movie. But it was set in the 70s, and, you know, the music alone would be expensive, the recreation of the period. So it, it was quote unquote a real movie. You know, I got to make a very personal film about 
what I remember high school feeling like, all kind of synthesized through one night, you know, the last night of school in 1976. One of the great things about getting to do this is you, there is a cathartic aspect. You do get to recycle things from your own experience. So that's where I, I really do work from a pretty specific autobiographical place, at least as a jumping off point. I think there hadn't been a lot of hit teenage movies at that moment. You know, the archetype is Rebel Without a Cause. You know, there's a car wreck, there's death. There's, you know, it's such a big deal. And I, I'm just working from a personal place. I'm just saying, well, I don't remember a lot of that. The essence for me of being a teenager was just riding around looking for something to do. I crammed everything interesting that happened to me, like my freshman year of high school, into kind of one day where nothing's happening, but everything's happening. We live in the same town, and he's practically like my nephew or something. I just feel like he's family. So if I had a, an event or something, he and his parents might come. We would meet, and you know, I might tell him, like, hey, when you at a party this year, or if you meet a girl and find yourself in an intimate conversation, I want you to write down what you say. You know, I would, I want, I want like a real teenage conversation here, or, you know, so he became a collaborator, you know, a full artistic collaborator with, with kind of, a, you know, assignments with a guy who, you know, saw the big picture of what the film was trying to articulate and was on board for it. So it was fun to see his maturation from a kid that, you know, when you're working with a seven-year-old, it's, it's, it's kind of a manipulation. Oh, now look here and, you know. And then to see him full-blown artistic collaborator, it was a fun trajectory, I guess. I mean, that's where I'm, I'm pretty promiscuous that way, probably because I think anything could be a story. You know, it's like, yeah, the most simple thing that happened in your life or, or something very personal, or obviously there's, there's big epic stories out there you can be attracted to. So I kind of feel like I've done a pretty big gamut. People think they have you, oh, here's the kind of stories you tell. I go, oh, really? Because to me, they seem very wide ranging. It's People true, but see, I ask about what happens in, in Before Midnight, I, well, nothing. I mean, it, it's yeah, real, I really uh, like the film, but nothing You're about happens. to see nothing. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But I, I have always rebelled against that. I remember, her, you know, the great Sam Fuller, you know, I remember him speaking at a thing. He says, cinema's about don't talk about it, show it. Yes, you know, in every film, yeah. RTF teacher will say, you know, it's a visual medium, just, you know, you just show, you don't talk about it. You don't talk about a character and experience. You show them having the experience. But I never, I never approached cinema like that. It never, I always thought people talking was so evocative and what they're describing, it has a double effect. People talking can be wonderfully cinematic. Really. Yeah, because not only does it conjure what they're talking about in the viewer's mind, because you're not showing it, to me it's more interesting because you not only do you get the essence of them and what they're saying but also what they're talking about waking life probably has the longest gestation of any film i've ever done in that the idea for the story predated my interest in film even it was based on a dream i had my senior year in high school that moved around in my head for 20 years and it never worked the film in my head didn't work it was too literal it just did never worked but when i saw this animation sample that these friends of mine were working on it was this kind of computer-based version of rotoscoping and i was like oh it just hit me rather quickly it was one of those great mashups of collision of like form and content this idea i had suddenly i go that thing that doesn't work in my head will work if it looks like that. We were off to the races. I started talking to them about it. And again, it was a film I couldn't really explain. That's when I know I'm in good territory, when I can't really explain the film I'm working on. It wasn't conventionally scripted. I had pages of notes and dialogues and ideas and scenes. And again, another one of those miracles of like, okay, can I get this film made? I remember at the time personally just thinking, like I was having trouble getting other movies made too. It was kind of a default. I kind of thought, I'm just gonna, maybe this will be the last movie I ever make. I mean, no one wants to give me money to make a movie. I'd made some movies that hadn't done well. So I was like, okay, this is maybe the last movie. You know, I just remember thinking I'm pouring everything into this one movie. I think it's a good way to work. I kind of have used time as a structuring device, maybe. Kind of in place of um, traditional plot, mm -hmm. you know. Like that's kind of phony to me to a large degree. A lot of that's, you know, kind of created. Mm -hmm. Whereas time is something we can all relate to. It's, it's kind of the, the way we process the world, the way we think, what, how we go through life. And so much of what I'm trying to do is kind of capture the, how it feels. Mm -hmm. you know? So I was really trying to not tell a story about childhood so much as what it feels like to grow up 
and in this case, what it feels like to be a parent, too, mm -hmm. to try to figure that out. So it's just kind of more the feel. So time for me works in that. You know, cinema has a very special relation with time mm -hmm. that I think is very fertile for, um, you know, new forms and things. But if you really think about it, you know, like we've all been at funerals and really sad times where people find humor or you tell funny stories about people. And humor can be very healing, you know, in the bad times. So uh, it's important, it's how we kind of persevere and find some kind of commonality. The, the little levity isn't bad. I never trusted art that's too serious. You know, if it's a serious subject treated too serious by the people around it, I just don't believe that. Mm -hmm. Because I think, oh, the worse things are, the more people are trying to counter that with humor yeah. and something else. Another thing, as a parent, my daughter was exactly the age of those kids. I think, had I not had a daughter that age, I, I would not have been good for that movie. And something in Jack's character I found very personal to me, kind of the, the slacker who society's looking down their nose at is not productive person. But in fact, he does have something to offer society.